Hello and welcome to this Dungeon Fog tutorial. We're going to be looking at the prop tool today. That's this chair, the fourth down in our column on the right, called Place Prop. When I left click on it, it opens up a huge array of options for us. Don't be intimidated. We're going to work our way through this and fill this map with props so that it makes sense. To kick off with, let's look at the very top. It says Prop and then it says Dungeon Fog underneath it. The important thing here is the downwards chevron. At the moment, I'm looking at all of the Dungeon Fog props. There are literally thousands of them available to you as a subscriber. This is an incredible list of things, and we're going to go through one or two of them, not all of them. However, the Downwards Chevron allows us to also look at our own uploaded props, as well as our own collections of props, which may be specific. There is a tutorial on how to upload your own props and assets, and you can check that out on the uh, website. Now, we're going to be talking just about the Dungeon Fog props today, so back to the Dungeon Fog options. And we see here that we have a whole lot of drop-down options, ranging from Cyberpunk to Fantasy to the Far East. We have dozens of flavor options in terms of uh, what we can add there, science fiction, transportation, food and drink, Greeks, dragons, all kinds of wonderful things. Guest artists have contributed as well. And then we've got modern sci-fi. Victorian and a whole lot of other options as well. Well, we're not going to go through each and every single one of those. That's for you to explore. The important thing to bear in mind is that each and every single one of these props behaves in exactly the same way. So if we look at the map that we have, our structure built into the side of a cliff with a little cave next to it. Let's say we want to decorate this as some kind of creepy mansion. First place I like to start is the lowest stuff. So what is on the floor of this uh, particular structure? And that's usually carpets and rugs and furs of animals and chairs next, and then tables, and then anything that needs to be above those. So that's usually the way that I work. Now, every single prop operates in the same way. So let's open up the props and uh, we've got containers, we've got decorations, we've got dungeon stuff, which is usually the more grim kind of things and uh, the first thing that catches my eye is we've got a wooden hatch here now it is incredibly daunting to have all of these props presented to you you may not know where to go looking however that's our next option the search item we can type in box and hit the enter button and it will show us all of the different boxes in all of the different categories that are called boxes so that's a really useful way to quickly and easily see all of the different types of boxes, from pizza boxes hmm, to a confessional box, all the way up to our standard kind of box. So that's a really, really powerful tool, and we can align it or arrange it in different ways as well. So we just see the props like that, or we see the props like this. Depending on how you like to work, it is up to you. Now, when you uh, want to deselect your search, all you can do is simply delete the keyword and press enter, and you go back to the usual menu. So let's say that this is our entrance hall. If we go back to our select tool and we select the room, we'll notice that this is labeled reception hall. That's why it's always good to label your rooms as you are designing them. This is our reception hall. So I would say that the first thing that we need are some columns. So let's bring up some columns. And you need to type in the first letters of that, by the way. So here we have uh, this column or that column option. We've got some Greek columns, lots of columns here. Um, overgrown columns, broken columns. I think these columns will work quite nicely. So I select the prop and you can see that the prop is now highlighted in orange as I have selected it. And now when I move it over my map, you see that the prop is presented in a ghost shape, showing me that this is roughly where the prop will land. Now, there are a lot of options that we can do with this particular prop. The very first one is simply to place it. So I'm going to place this particular column, let's say here. And all I do is left click and that automatically places the column. Now I can continue to place columns as I so choose. So let's put another one there and then another one there and then another one there to make a nice completed space. I'm now done with that so I don't need columns anymore. Thank you very much. That can now go back to its default and I can now look at these columns. Now notice that it will still want to place down these columns until I have selected some other prop or I have selected another tool. So I'm going to select, for the purposes of this demonstration, back to the Select tool, and now I can select each of the columns. 
This is going to give us a vast amount of information on the particular prop. The very first one is the rotation of the prop. Currently it's set at zero degrees. I can manually type in this value by typing it in and then you'll notice that the prop is rotating around that particular angle as I am typing it in. And uh, that's very, very useful for lining things up. I'm going to leave it on zero at the moment, however. The scaling tool does exactly what you expect it to do. If I type in 200, it scales the column up to 200% of its original size. That's uh, a little bit too big for us. Of course, I can make it smaller or bigger. The mirror tool, the mirror H and V, horizontal or vertical, I'm going to zoom in on our map. So to zoom in, I press Control and scroll with my mouse wheel, Control and scroll. I'm now zooming into the map. I'm quite, quite close here. This is so that you can see the difference. When I select the prop, all I do is if I hit the uh, mirror H, mirror the horizontal, it will flip the image on its uh, horizontal axis. That's very useful for creating slightly different looking props, using the same prop, making it look slightly different, changing the angle. Very useful for roots and trees and things to make it look a lot more organic and different from its other columns or trees or objects in the map. If I mirror the vertical, it will do the same thing, but obviously in the opposite direction. And if I slap them both on, it will rotate them all the way around. So that's really cool. Now, above walls. This is an interesting concept to understand. If I left click and drag the column so that it's sitting halfway across the wall, Dungeon Fog automatically truncates all props based on which room they're in. So they will never stick through a wall. Now, the way to know in which room the prop will be is wherever your mouse cursor first left clicked. So, for example, my mouse cursor is going to left click in the bottom half of this picture. If I drag the column up, as long as my cursor remains in the large reception room, the prop will remain in the reception room, even though the majority of it is in this little passageway here. If I were to left click on the prop and I were to drag it into this new little corridor, the prop would now sit in the corridor and not in that room or in this room, even though it overlaps. So Dungeon Fog is using your cursor to determine in which room the prop will be based. So it doesn't matter where you click, it is where your cursor is at the end of that where the prop will be placed. It's quite a tricky concept. So what does that have to do, if I just put this back to where it was, what does that have to do with above walls? Well, what it means is, is I can place a prop halfway between a wall and anywhere else. And if I select above the walls, the prop is automatically placed over the wall. In other words, it will extend through that wall. This can be really useful if you want to place down trees that are growing above the building and you want the trees to overlap slightly, or if you want to indicate that there are certain things that transcend wall barriers. So that's the above walls option. I'm going to deselect that for now. Returning our column to its original position, we now have the option of adding a drop shadow or removing it. With the drop shadow in place, it does look like the columns are, to a certain degree, floating above the stone floor. That might be the look you're going for. If I deselect it, however, notice now that the column looks as if it's part of the floor. This is a choice that you make in terms of determining your artistic style. I'm going to turn it back on again. Now, remember, we spoke about props being used as part of the GM notes. There are many options that you have when dealing with props, and I'm going to add in a different prop here. I uh, am going to add in, let's say, a wooden hatch. So I'm going to put a wooden hatch. It would be an awkward place to put it there, but uh, well, let's put it here anyway for the sake of demonstration. So the wooden hatch now has this strange shadow around it, which doesn't look like it belongs. So if I take that away, now the wooden hatch looks as if it is sitting on the floor itself. But I want to say that the hidden this hatch is it requires a key in order for it to be unlocked. I can select this option needs key and you'll notice that there is now a red dot on the prop. This red dot would not be displayed to players if they were using the virtual viewer of Dungeon Fog, but it would be displayed to the GM reminding you that this prop needs a key. It could also be concealed. The prop is automatically semi-transparent. Again, it is visible to the GM, but not to the players if you're using the Dungeon Fog Priority Viewer. All of this information is then logged in the GM notes, which we'll talk about in another video. Finally, the very same prop could also be trapped. This is a doozy of a prop now. Not only is it trapped, it's also hidden and it needs a key. The prop has now gone red, indicating that it is trapped. 
Once again, the players will not see this because they will be looking either at the player viewer or at your printout. Your printout will not indicate that the trapdoor is there at all. However, your GM notes will include the fact that there is a trapped, locked trapdoor. I'm going to deselect all of those for now, just so that we don't have a strange red overlay, and continue on what we can and can't do with these props. There is also a snap to grid option. This allows the prop to literally snap to the grid. If you want props to line up perfectly, for example, these columns might need to line up properly, I would choose snap to grid, and then it would automatically snap to the grid. This creates a great sense of symmetry, which most buildings used to have. Now we know that those are all lined up as they are snapping to the grid. We then have our colorize options, and these are, as we have seen in the room texture tool, they are exactly the same. We have our hue values, which we can slide around and change the value of the trapdoor as we so like. We have our saturation value, which increases the saturation or decreases the saturation. And of course, we have our luminance values, which decrease or increase the luminance. We also, however, have our transparency. This is something new, and that is literally how, how transparent the object is or is not. Sometimes transparency can be useful for indicating that something is above the map, such as tree branches and the like, or if it's underwater, transparency makes it vague and appear as if it's not on the surface but below the surface. A really useful and powerful tool. We also have our colorize options, and again, that just overrides all of the color as before, and we can change the color as we so like, as well as the saturation, as well as the luminance values. And we have control over our transparency too. Of course, to deselect that, we simply select colorize again, and it defaults it back to its normal value. So those are all of the options that we have, and once again, we can change the name specifically. So if we wanted it to say, instead of wooden hatch, it could be access underground passage. That might be of use to us, and so we have that option to change. And we do have the trash can if we want to get rid of the prop. Control Z is your friend. But let's go back to our prop tools now and discuss all of this information that is listed here. Because not only do we have control over the prop once we've placed it, when we are placing props, there are some cool features that Dungeon Fog has. Now, if I wanted this room to be filled with barrels, for example, I could left click and select the barrels and place each and every single one of the barrels. But that's awfully tedious. What I could do is start to use these controls. Now, automatically, I can decide the rotation and the scale. I can select whether the object is mirrored, vertically or horizontally. I can preset whether the object is above the walls or below, whether it casts a shadow, whether it needs a key, is it concealed, is it trapped, does it snap to the grid? Those are all controls that you have before you place the prop or after you've placed the prop. What you don't have after you've placed the prop is the ability to randomize. If I select randomize, it will allow me to randomize the rotation of the object. If I select somewhere between, let's say, 10% and 360 degrees, which I don't have to type in, I can leave as default, then the prop will automatically start rotating as I place it. This is very powerful in terms of making these barrels look as if they're slightly different, not the same prop repeated. I'm going to undo that so that I can show you the next option that we have. That's the option to change the scale. Again, we can type in whatever values we like, and as I place down the prop, it's going to automatically change the rotation and change the scale of these barrels. Not so useful when we're dealing with barrels, but when creating foliage and placing plants and the like, it can be really useful. Then, of course, it will also randomize whether it's flipping the mirror uh, on the horizontal or on the vertical. Really powerful tools to instantly create very different looking objects from the same object. So I'm going to deselect these because otherwise it will default through to them and it will keep the scale if I don't change it back to 100%. But let's say, for example, we don't want to use the randomizers. We want to be able to control the scale of the barrel ourselves. This is where one of the more powerful tools comes into play, and that's the shortcut keys. So control scroll zooms your map in and out. Control shift scroll changes the size of the prop. Notice the prop value under the scaling increasing and decreasing as I roll my scroll wheel forward or backwards. That's really powerful. 
If I, however, let go of control and shift and just hold the shift key down, I can now rotate the object before I place it. So I can rotate that prop, then I hold down control shift and I can increase or decrease its size, let go of control, keep shift selected, and now I can rotate it. I can let go of control or shift at any time and place my prop and then press control and shift and rescale the barrel or shift and just rotate that barrel. And then I can place it wherever I like. Now notice I'm holding down the shift key again. Not only does this allow me to rotate the prop, but it also snaps to grid automatically. That's a very powerful tool. So control and shift are your friends when it comes to customizing your props as well as their placement. So I am going to control shift and increase my prop back to 100% and then I'm going to hold down the shift key and rotate it around so that I can then place it as I like. Now, if I don't want it to be on the grid, I don't hold the shift key, but if I want it to be on the grid, I hold the shift key and it snaps into place. As simple as that. This can be really good if you want to micro tune exactly the rotation of the object that you want or not. This concludes our demonstrations of all the things that you can do with the prop tool.